to Rear Square, uh, the Maidan uprisings in Ukraine, the Gezi Park protests in Turkey, Occupy Wall Street, and the Umbrella Revolution in Hong Kong. All of these movements represent um, uprisings that occurred amongst the population that were enabled by technology and social media, but fell short of their goals in many important ways. And I believe it's because people tried to use social media without really first looking at a fundamental, uh, having a fundamental sense of how people organize themselves. So, a little bit on how you're probably organized right now. How many of you are sitting next to someone that you know? Many, many, many of you. Uh, many of you are also, by, by definition, sitting next to people that you don't know. But notice how we cluster into small groups of two or three. And we tend to do this at scale as well, and that tendency is called homophilia. Most people tend to, to uh, adopt a position of homophily, um, and usually just a little bit to the right of that on this graph, with the very far extreme being a sort of ideal goal of xenophilia. And a xenophilia would be to actively seek out others, people who are very unlike you, and many of us within this community show that tendency. But yet, as a whole, we still sort of operate in a collective way, and you can actually measure that. So, that's one of the exciting things about social networks uh, over the last few years, is we've been able to actually measure this and see how that works. So this is a map of my hometown of Baltimore, Maryland, USA. And um, what you can see here, this is not a geographic map at all. So don't think about latitude and longitude. Think instead about people. Each dot on this map represents a person or a business, something like that. And each line represents a relationship. The layout of people on this map is determined by the relationships between them. So people that have more relationships with each other are clustered closer together on the graph. And the colors represent shared communities of interest within those, uh, the, the broader community. So one of the things you see on this map is that over on the right, very far right, you have geeks and the TEDx community <laughs> very far off on the edge. I'm about in the second E of geek right there. Um, and uh, you can see that, you know, that, that puts me in touch with, if you, if you could read all those accounts there, there would be things like the mayor of the city and the newspaper and the television station and media and things like that. And then you notice that there's an orange section for sports. That's where we have the Ravens, American football team, as well as the Baltimore Orioles baseball team. And then as you get over, you get into um, a big community around um, hip hop and uh, rap music, things like that. And then if you get very far over, you get into a whole group of people that identify really more with the region than with living in the city. Now, this is a problem to some extent because all these people live in the same city. Our city is quite small. It's maybe like seven square miles. But yet, these people are living in totally separate existence. The people in the green part of this section there uh, call Baltimore Smaltimore because we run into each other all the time. Now, let me show you how this same sort of graphing uh, implements itself uh, in other cities. But first, I want to also touch on this aspect. There's a guy at MIT who's maybe the uh, leading uh, uh, person studying this idea of computational social science. And what he's finding is that there are certain tendencies that display within networks that apply not just in humans, but also in things like bees and other sorts of uh, organisms that have colonies. And there's a few key things that um, characterize sort of healthy networks, and they are short and frequent communication, high participation amongst all of the people within the community, um, acknowledgement of that participation from everybody within the community, as well as the idea of continuous exploration, of finding people that are outside of your circle, and really this idea of xenophilia, of seeking out people that are different from you. On the opposite side of that, there's networks that show low frequency of communication, low participation, um, they're more broadcast with little feedback, and then they have little to no exploration. That can actually affect the brain development negatively of organisms within those communities to the point where offspring of people that display those negative tendencies actually do not seek out and do exploration themselves. So if you look at a city like San Francisco, you see a similar kind of arrangement of like geeks. There's actually a whole section of people that are so clearly identifiable that they're obviously Twitter employees. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and if you notice, the Twitter employees are the exact opposite of the hip-hop community. <laughs> um, and then you also have like sports and food and the LGBT community, things like that. Um, and again, people kind of cluster into their own groups. And one of the things that you see in San Francisco is that people are really starting to resent the geeks. So you see things like this, evict Twitter. 
because people are, you know, who are not part of the tech community are starting to resent the influx of cash and the um, you know, high rents and all the things that that brings with it. So let's look at some other places. I, a few weeks ago, I mapped Rio de Janeiro. And one of the interesting things about this is that you still see kind of, you know, this TEDx Rio geek segment down here that's similar to what you saw in San Francisco as well as uh, Baltimore. You also see a great deal of mixing in the middle. And if you kind of go up to the top, that's probably mostly people that are sort of in the favelas and things like that, mostly younger people. Um, and then you see a lot of music as well. And there's just this tremendous diversity of stuff going on in Rio, and, and there seems to be a little bit more mixing in this city than I would say exists in many other cities, so that's interesting to see. Um, Istanbul. I happened to be there a few weeks ago and see some really interesting things here. Um, again, you have the kind of geek community, the TEDx Istanbul folks, lots of brands, media, newspapers, things like that. Those were the earliest Twitter users in Istanbul. And then you have kind of the conservative, religious, and political stuff that um, is probably mostly associated with the ruling party and people that are more sympathetic to kind of a conservative, religious point of view. And then you have sports, mostly football, um, that acts kind of as a connector in the center of the community, and that's probably a good thing, draws people together around something that they can share in common. But then you see this, and you notice that this is by far the largest group of people in Istanbul. And it's young men, mostly frustrated young men, who really, really, really want girls to like them, and they'll write poetry to prove it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they're writing poetry all day long. But the really interesting thing about these people, and the people next to them here, these uh, uh, young adults, um, is that you know, it would be great if we could figure out a way to get them to become explorers of networks and not just be clustered amongst themselves. Some of those young men that are writing poems have like 100,000 followers. So you know, it's, a, it's a big deal to try to figure out how to integrate those folks with the rest of the network. You also see up at the top, inorganic traffic. These are people who are astroturfing the, the messages of the ruling party um, and helping to spread and create trending topics um, around you know, things like news stories that the ruling party wants to spread. And then you have this over here, sex, specifically gay porn uh, as well. And um, you know, one of the things you find in, in uh, areas that have kind of repressive censorship regimes is that things like this, gay porn, tend to pop up on Twitter as opposed to being on the regular uh, internet. So let's take a look at Munich. Now, I was surprised a little bit with some of what I found in Munich. One thing, though, <laughs> that should not surprise me is FC Bayern. <laughs> now, a, a problem that I had both in Munich and Barcelona was figuring out how to extract all of the uh, FC Bayern fans from uh, internationally from the ones here locally in Munich. And I think this is pretty fair. This, this gives you a good chunk here. Uh, but uh, let's look at some other communities. The tech geeks and computer stuff, big data people over here. You notice TEDx Munich is kind of right in the center, which is kind of uh, a little bit uh, unusual. Um, <laughs> And then you have like radio, newspapers, magazines, photos, things like that. Um, some of the big other newspapers, they somewhat are in their own cluster. And then you have like social media marketing, online publications, um, things like that. And then the Pirate Party, how many of you know the Pirate Party, the folks that started up in Berlin, they're, they're well represented here. A whole group of people talking about travel. And then web developers and coders down here with the tech geeks and then more politics, radio, newspaper, and TV. And I'm not gonna belabor this point, but what you kind of see here in, in Munich is that the entire city, and I looked really hard for more data, looks a lot like the initial sort of geek lobe of all the other cities. And what you don't have here represented is like minorities and you know, other sorts of younger voices that are you know, starting to kind of question the status quo, things like that, it's very stable. Many of these accounts and these groups of people have had accounts on here for like four or five years and it hasn't changed very much since then. So just to give you some sense, Twitter is growing dramatically faster in a place like Turkey than it is in a place like Munich. So I kind of predict that over the next few years, you know, you'll start to see this sort of pattern start to emerge where you know, more and more people in Munich are getting connected and online and you'll start to see that it looks more like other cities. But, you know, there are reasons why I think it's going at a slower pace. I mean, there's a kind of a German character thing, I think, around people maybe not wanting to share quite as much and all the time the way a lot of the rest of the world seems to want to. Um, and then also around privacy. Um, and let's talk about that, because at the end of the day, this data really matters. It really matters to help people figure out how to govern their countries. And if you wanted to create social change, 
this is a really good tool. So, you know, if you're going to start a online uh, revolution with, you know, Twitter and whatnot, you kind of need to know what the map of your city is in order to do that effectively. And if that data is locked up behind the walls of Twitter and Facebook and the US NSA <laughs> and other places that have this data, as well as, you know, you, the, you, each government's own uh, sort of surveillance agencies, that creates a differential in power, and this kind of data needs to be in the hands of the people. Additionally, thank you. Additionally, if you think about the problem that Twitter and Facebook are trying to solve, it's around engagement. They're not necessarily trying to solve a problem around getting people the data around their own communities. So, and they're also not trying to help them become healthier cities. So, in some ways, we need a recommendation engine that's based on finding people that are the most different from you, rather than the ones that are just the same as you. I believe that this kind of data is the foundation for journalism. You know, we used to rely on newspapers and media to help us discover new ideas and to uh, uncover the networks and how things worked in our cities. We can no longer do that to the degree that we did because of changes in business model. This kind of data can help people provide that kind of coverage for their own communities as well as, as the basis for uh, news agencies to create their own stories around this kind of data, and we need to be able to get at it. And I think we're just now starting to get to the idea that this kind of data is as important a human need as a free press has been until now. So, again, if we don't put this power into the hands of the people, it will be only in the hands of others. And the next time you click like or follow, think about getting access to the body of data that you're creating, because it's vital to the health of your community. So, join me if you'd like to collaborate with me on this. You can email me at davetroy@gmail.com. You can look at some of the maps that I've published at peoplemaps.org. Thank you.